Oh. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Bay ICT Tech Talk for February. Uh, I'm Olivia Hereford, and I'm with BACCC. And uh, I am a project lead for the Re Regional Virtual Production Academy. And we're delighted to have virtual production as a topic for the Bay IC T Tech Talk. And um, I've invited uh, Joanne Dinning to uh, moderate today. Joanne is department chair of art, digital media and film production at Diablo Valley College. And we have today our guest, um, Catherine Brillhart, who is um, a virtual production supervisor and cinematographer. And she's gonna take us into a discussion about demystifying real-time workflows and the virtual production department. So Joanne, I'm gonna hand it over to you to get us started. Okay, uh, thank you, Olivia. Uh, so we're so excited to have Catherine here tonight. Uh, the DVC team met Catherine at the Infinity Festival in Hollywood. Uh, where Catherine was presenting on virtual production as part of the Cinematographer Director's Toolkit. And we were just captivated by what she was saying and we learned so much and it was it was incredible to be there. And so we kind of jumped on her after um, afterwards and uh, she agreed to connect with us um, and she's given us a lot of uh, information and advice as we uh, move forward in our quest to build our regional virtual production academy. So I know some of you are students coming in and you might be confused about what is virtual production. I know Catherine will probably help you understand that, um, but just a little bit of info. Uh, virtual production is a kind of a catch-all phrase for all film production with a virtual or CGI based element. Uh, VP is a cinemagraphic technique that seamlessly combines physical and virtual elements, uh, usually using a suite of software tools. And studios can film on a stage and view virtual graphics together in real time. And they can change locations, and it's as simple as swapping out a background. And directors, actors, and other stakeholders can see the final film assets and instantly make changes. Uh, so it's it really... Um, you know, has emerged a lot uh, during the pandemic and uh, it's very exciting. And so Olivia Hereford is our fearless leader and she has gotten us all together, the six colleges. Uh, we have Laney, Berkeley City, Mission, um, Santa Rosa, Diablo Valley, and Ohlone. I think I, I called them all out as part of our regional group. And our academy is going to uh, kind of make virtual production curriculum and uh, this first certificate that we're opening in fall 2023 available to all students across the region. We have uh, we are intending to uh, open three virtual production studios. We already have the first one open at the DVC campus, uh, which is super exciting. It just opened in January, so we're 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 getting it all set up. And uh, we are hoping to develop uh, three additional certificates, including a professional certificate for people already working in industry. And then we want to um, develop an AA and a bachelor's. So we were very ambitious and we're really excited. We've had tremendous support from industry. And so who is Catherine Brillhart? Catherine Brillhart is a cinematographer, director, and producer who leverages volumetric capture, visualization techniques, and supervising visual effects to enhance projects. And for the past decade, she has helped to redefine best practices and standards in virtual production and has advocated for diversity in the film industry through her role on the Global Board of Directors um, for the Visual Effects Society. Uh, Catherine is a member of the Virtual Production Committee with the ASC Motion Imaging and Technology Council, and her recent work as a role and role as a virtual production supervisor incorporate real-time game engine and virtual production techniques to achieve in-camera visual effects, including uh, her work on projects such as uh, Warner Brothers Black Adam, Netflix Rebel Moon, and Amazon Studios Fallout. And you know what? What I particularly love about Catherine is her commitment to diversifying the industry. Uh, we, as an academy, that is our mission and our goal. Um, we are right up there with schools like USC. Uh, we've been given sort of the nod of approval from some people in industry who say, 
you might be even ahead of some of the, the private colleges that are developing these pathways and curriculum. So we're really proud of ourselves and we really hope to support um, equity and inclusion in this industry. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Catherine, and really excited to hear what you have to say. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be with all of you. Um, so I'll just I'll kind of dive in a little bit and give you a bit of like the background of my passion for kind of getting into things. Um, so as Joanne mentioned, I'm, I'm a cinematographer and that's kind of like my true north, you know, really that and directing. And uh, as I was building my career, you know, I went to film school and then moved out to LA and as I was kind of getting jobs and uh, freelancing, it was sort of the beginning of the digital camera revolution. So at the time, there was a lot of similar messaging about how um, cameras going digital would democratize the industry because, you know, only people who had access to film and film cameras for a long time could, um, you know, pay to play and like, develop skill set in this craft. So um, it was just interesting because even early on in my career, as I was getting a job as a first assistant camera, I was exposed to visual effects and like collecting that data on set along with my camera notes and started asking more questions. And it made me ask more questions about, wait, what does it mean to really finish a shot? Because there are things that I can't even achieve with the camera and the tool that I have in school or just that I've rented. You know, how, do, how are people really doing this? What's happening behind the scenes? And the more I learned about visual effects and post visual effects and shot design and shot construction, um, I kind of started building this parallel career, career in visual effects for over 12 years now. And it just gave me a way to, um, one, create equity opportunities for myself. Like, you know, I think I'm somebody who has not been able to pursue cinematography in a straight line. Um, it's very expensive to kind of pursue that and not make a lot of money, you know, and have to keep going forward. But visual effects had way more opportunities for a lot of different people. Um, and I could do longer jobs to kind of sustain myself and still take camera work, but then learn these other skills on the side. So all of that to say, um, I started seeing this opportunity for visual effects and camera to join and so did the greater industry. And as VR kind of movement you know, started happening, uh, like a lot of funding was going into that in 2012, 2013, around that time. Um, these conversations around virtual production um, being democratized started happening. And I thought that was totally fascinating. Um, and that's, those were some moments where I started to see cinematography as a career path in a different way. And I started seeing visual effects and production design and all these different um, creative uh, career paths in a different way. Um, around that time, you started realizing that these game engines uh, and real-time technology were going to be incorporated into filmmaking, and uh, you needed to be able to adapt that into your workflow to kind of keep up with the way that uh, production in general was going. And so I think what you've seen in the last three or four years is um, a really great collaboration between a bunch of different companies that provide different virtual production, real-time services in the industry coming together and formalizing what it means to incorporate, incorporate real-time uh, into production. So I feel like now that we're on the other side of the pandemic and people are going back into production, and there's been a lot more education um, at higher levels about what virtual production is. Um, there are gonna be more pathways carved for to more job opportunities in all of the different fields within production that already exist, including a new department, which is virtual production. And I'm sure that over time, you know, virtual production might just be incorporated as a regular thing into uh, different departments. So that's like the future of it. But not to get ahead of myself, I'll go to my first slide here. Um, there we go. Um, and I just, I wanted to show 
and kind of like put out like a lookbook board of like different types of virtual production because I think the flashiest thing that people talk about are LED wall workflows. And those are definitely the most complex. Um, they're very visual. You can look at examples from Mandalorian and other shows and see behind the scenes and kind of see how a lot of these different pieces come together because you end up using a lot of these techniques and workflows on projects like that. But um, if you're if you want to incorporate these workflows into like a any project, you can just take pieces of them. You don't have to kitchen sink them or use all of them to be considered like a virtual production project. So I'll just kind of go through them um, to give you a bit of an overview. Um, and I, I was thinking it might be fun to even talk about software that you might need to know or like how to get started in that if any of these are interesting to you. Um, and then I'll kind of tie it together and show how you can use all of them in an LED wall workflow. So the first one I'll talk about is real-time visualization tools and like visualization. Um, so for a long for a long time now, like 15 or 20 years, um, there have been companies and individual specialists and artists that are dedicated to using, you know, years ago it was just computer graphics or like my like animation software and now it's game engines but they're able to kind of help a director and dp visually design shots and take the script from being a written script or 2d storyboards into a 3d space so that they can workshop ideas and um kind of make the film before they make the film you know dramas or like films that like are maybe more like romantic comedies like things that are very straightforward to shoot you probably won't have DPs and directors, you know, doing 3D visualization. Um, but if you have a film that's like Call of the Wild, for example, that came out, you know, within the last five years, it's a photo reel, like live action film with animated characters. And, you know, with that, I think the DP, the DP and director had to one, prove to the studio that they could make a film about talking dogs that everyone would like. So there was a benefit to making the film um, in a very low budget sort of 3D way in real time quickly, like sketching that out in 3D, the benefit of the project. Um, and then they were able to use all of the data from those 3D visualizations all the way to the end of the pipeline in visual effects and just refine that animation and refine those shots using different visual effects software and rendering tools. Um, so all of that was used from beginning to end. So, um, and you know, DPs will use visualization for like really challenging shots, like, uh, you know, like it's hard to ex explain like an example, but you know, like let's say they wanna do a trick where like an actor is in front of the camera, has choreography that has to move and they're not sure which tool to use. They can demo in a CG, so in a, a game engine, do we want to use a technocrate and do we want to use a dolly? What's the handoff like? Um, and these are, it's really beneficial to do stuff like this because you can do it virtually as well. So if people have a tight schedule, it's like, this is a great way to work. Um, so that's kind of a like visualization and I'd say, uh, specialty skills in that area, like you're interested, you're passionate about shot design. You can be interested in like uh, framing the camera, uh, like performance and blocking of actors because you're doing that a lot um, in that world. Um, sequences, like how shots progress and tell a story, like story in general. It's a very story driven kind of fun team to be on. Um, and then, you know, each of these also have like engineering components and all that. Um, the next one to talk about is real-time virtual art department and animation. And those are related to the visualization too, because you need to have a world built so that when you put the cameras in the world, you can uh, create the shots for the director. Um, but I separated it out mainly because um, you know, there's the bad, there's the virtual arts department, there's like the world building and animation that can go into visualization. But then there's just using game engines to create a fully animated project. And I think that's something that's 
super new in the last couple of years that you have access to that we all do, which is we could make a Pixar looking kind of animated film, but you don't necessarily have to be an animator or have those skill sets. You could use uh, performance capture in the physical world and camera tracking of like actual shots that you've shot by hand and put those in an animated world. So I kind of had that as a separate category here. Um, a virtual production can be a fully animated piece that uses physical aspects of production or puts that in the virtual world. So there are a couple of ways that you can apply that in front of it. The next one is performance capture. And, you know, by capturing somebody's performance in, with a student tracking, um, whether it's in a volume or not, um, that data can help speed up the process of visualization or creating your animated project um, by having a, like a live performer perform the action instead of having um, hand-done keyframe animation. They're two different workflows. Mm -hmm. you, you might want to have some keyframe animation to finesse the performance capture that you've got, but um, it's just another real-time technique that can go into these workflows to help the process. Um, Simulcam I put on there because it's been around for a long time. Um, and it's mainly used with green screen, but they're still real time. They're like, I guess I'd say like recently there are real time components to it where um, it's basically the practice of live compositing virtual elements with live action. Um, and it's very helpful for like on set having a cinematographer and director, if you're shooting green screen, see like a virtual character or virtual environment in camera while you're shooting or composing a shot. So you can light correctly and do all that. And there are specific times when you'd want to use that. Um, but that's another interesting kind of onset technique. Um, and then the last three are kind of related to what we've already talked about. Um, two of which are like inside an LED volume. Uh, LED volumes are really cool. They're sort of a um, advanced, what do, I want, what do I want to call it? They're like a, the new trans light or they're the new rear projection, essentially. So if you take time to research uh, rear projection techniques and trans lights and the, the use of those, you'll see that throughout history, like for almost a hundred years, people have been using those techniques, but they've had to use projectors to get images to play behind actors or like lit photography or you know map painting work. So that's kind of what you're introducing with an LED wall. But what's cool about the content on an LED wall is that one in kind of that first picture with the hybrid green screen, it means that you can turn the wall into a really clean green screen that doesn't need to be lit by other lights. It's just lighting itself. And so there's less spill of the green screen on the actor. Um, it's kind of an expensive choice <laughs> if you just, if that's the only problem you're solving. But what's cool about certain applications of this is that if you set it up the right way, you could have the actual background plate recording simultaneously as the green screen. So you could have, you could be shooting and capturing the same image with two different backgrounds at once, basically in camera, which is a very new thing and very cool. Um, and then the other image where I caught 100% final pixel content, um, I would just say that what's exciting and different about LED walls compared to projection is one, if you're doing rear projection, there's always been a challenge of having not enough light inside the projector to make it bright enough so that you can evenly light, uh, use your set lighting and have a strong enough projected image so that uh, it looks seamlessly composited together. So having more control over the brightness of the overall LED panels is phenomenal. Also, it adds this real-time animation and tweaking of the background. So let's say you 
creating a full 3D world with your virtual art department and that bad team that we talked about. Um, you could have more flexibility to change the sun, direction of the sun, or like rearrange, you know, trees or objects in the background and compose your shot on set with the production designer during prep. So it opens up new ways of working with your production team around um, visual effects and their conversations around final picks of visual effects. And that's the idea that, um, well, what if we wanna make some complicated, really complicated shots, like less complicated visual effects shots? Like what can we get in camera? Maybe uh, the idea is that you, you know going into it that you have some visual effects shots, but you'd like to get them in camera. And so how do you do that by creating environments and playing your shots? That's, those are the kinds of things that you can do in the LED volume. And then camera and object tracking, I put at the end because they're kind of related to all of this, all these different things, you know, camera tracking you need for sample cam, you need it for visualization, um, you need that for LED volume work. Um, and you can also just do it, do it separately um, with like for virtual scouting with the director. Um, so that's kind of that's kind of a brief overview, and I just wanted to start there, um, basically. But one of the key concepts, like now that we're talking about all these different techniques, and something that I have to do when I meet a director um, on a project is kind of like look at the script understand the user experience that the director wants to have with the technology if they're really interested in it. And we always start with a conversation, well, what problem are we trying to solve? Like, is it a creative, is it a story problem? Is it something technical? Like, you know, do you need to, because of the actor schedule, do you need to have a night shoot at the beginning of a project? And then it makes more sense to kind of plan around doing an LED volume, you know, little things like that. But I would say that the key understanding would be that um, the content and the directors drive what virtual production is. So those conversations that you have early on, you'll start to understand like what they'd like to do. And, you know, like a director might say, I wanna use visualization to plan out these difficult shots, but I don't think we need an LED wall. And that's great. Or they might feel like virtual scouting would really help their relationship with the DP. So that's something that, um, you know, virtual production artists can help with. Um, so let's see, I'm going to go on this slide. Um, so here's kind of, I just put together a timeline just to show, I think it's really interesting to see like which projects are coming out when and like maybe how far back this is happening. And if you think about it, Avatar coming out in 2009 means a lot of these techniques were being thought about earlier than that even. Um, and so I'd say over the past 15 years, like certain techniques such as visualization, performance capture and volumetric capture have been considered an essential part of the uh, visual effects department actually. And it's only been in recent years as virtual production workflows have become accessible to a wider variety of teams that breaking out certain techniques, the ones that we just looked at into a separate department has become necessary in order to track ownership of certain responsibilities staffing the teams and figuring out equipment. Um, so how virtual production is integrated into the project will depend on all those early conversations around the script with the director. And in some circumstances, individual specialists or teams are hired by production or internally to become part of an, an existing department. So some of the examples for this might be, uh, you know, they only want virtual scouting visualization, or they only want uh, to use performance capture and camera tracking because it applies to like an animated project or something. Um, in the first scenario, a specialist or a vendor could be hired by production to provide these services. And then in that second scenario, um, a specialist or vendor would likely be hired by the visual effects department because the data is captured uh, is for that department. So there are a couple of different ways it could go. But in regards to much more complex real-time workflow integrations with LED workflows, um, 
Let's take a look at a basic virtual production department org chart to see how the teams and techniques fit into the production. Um, so this is really very basic and stripped down. But uh, when it comes to virtual production, if substantial real-time workflows are needed, like you know, they're doing an LAV wall workflow and like three to five of the techniques that we looked at are going to be used. Um, I would say it's a department of its own, and this is kind of what it's going to start to look like. And so virtual production is, especially in the depart in this format, is a uh, inherently R and D um, sort of area. And it requires a deep knowledge base in cinematography, visual effects, and engineering. The team skill sets often need to overlap in ways that are essential to agile workflows, and they might contradict the team's uh, or the teamwork style of traditional union roles or visual effects waterfall workflows. And the virtual production department requires leadership that understands these nuances, anticipates how the differences can cause friction and can clear a path for artists involved, the department heads they're collaborating with and the director. And in this department diagram, I've highlighted the general virtual production department roles in yellow to show how they hook in with the production department in green. And the arrows show a hierarchy of communication. So in simple terms, you've got all your department heads and I couldn't fit all of them in this diagram, but I just put some of the ones that I work with the most. Um, so when I'm on a department, I'm the department head and I have a producer that's usually working with me. Um, the other department heads, I get the production designer, the DP, the visual effects producer and supervisor, uh, like stunts, you know, all these different people. We report to the director and we're making sure that their vision is um, kind of protected and our department's working toward the goal of, of the director. Um, and what that means from a communication standpoint is, you know, I have talks with the director about creative, with the department heads as well. And then I relay those messages back to the team. And then depending on how we structure our prep as a team with the director, the DP, the visual effects supervisor, different teammates that I have um, on from each of these departments, they are also elevated to like be part of those conversations. So for example, in prep, um, I would have meetings around uh, virtual art department, the world building, and like the previs and the shot design and the camera placement. And so we might have different meetings for both, even though they're all invited to each other's meeting to listen or participate. And uh, I'll make sure that my previs or tech this lead has a really good relationship with the director and the production designer and the DP so that they can have creative conversations. So I do a lot of facilitating of those conversations. Same with that, just making sure that communication is open um, for all the different stages of prep. And then as we are also prepping internally as a department, I'm building a stage ops team and I'm making sure that that team has understanding of what creative is coming down the pipeline so that we can anticipate the director's needs on set technically. We can anticipate the camera department's needs on set and the production designer's needs on set. And then actually even visual effects and, um, and stunts and all of these other groups. So that's kind of happening in parallel. But I wanted to show how they're sort of related to each other in this work chart form. And I created this roadmap specifically for LED wall workflows because um, it's just a different way of looking at that work chart, basically. All of the different mini teams of a virtual production department are represented here in different colors. And I just show from story, development, to design, to virtual set construction, all the way through the shoot, when people are kind of brought on and when those conversations start. So, you know, obviously you start with like myself and other de department heads would start with story development and talking to the director about their vision. We were coming up with a plan and like who we would need to hire and what 
departments make sense within our own teams. Um, the directors working with the production designer on design. And when the design and pieces of the design are finished, then I would have my virtual art department queued up, ready to receive those designs. And they're kind of become like this virtual set construction team. They start building a world and we, and we have a rough world. Then I pull in the pre viz and tech viz artists. And those artists uh, are like shop designers. So because we have the world, now we can start adding cameras virtually and kind of demo like actor blocking and like look at storyboards in a more interactive way. We can do more virtual scouting in that step. Um, and uh, after that visualization phase, you um, that's where I was saying, I kind of end up bringing in that stage ops team because now we have more visualization. We have more understanding of what the shot designs are. So now we can bring in a team that can plan uh, the technical execution of those shots as it relates to the actual volume or LED wall um, and do all of that prep. Usually on a test stage, hopefully you get to work on the exact same stage that you're working on. It's different every time. Um, they're definitely better ways than others, but yeah, you're all kind of working together for that kind of old shoot. Um, and I'd just say like for any project, these roadmaps vary and they're kind of customized to the project, but I just wanted to show like a very general like, order of things to make it kind of simple. Um, so I've heard just a couple of considerations for indie filmmakers. Um, you know, like I was just thinking, what are the top three things that I, I would just need to think about if I wanted to get into any of these workflows or like LED walls or any of it? Um, so I would start with one, like a basic understanding for visual effects techniques and shot design. So there's so many different points of entry for that interest. You could be coming from a passion for visual effects and designing shots without a camera, just designing them in a computer. Um, you could be coming from a cinematography background and understand shot composition and then how to add like compositing techniques and other things to those shots. But um, I would say try to, these days, I would try to hit that understanding at many different angles and look at it from different perspectives and really understand um, like not just the singular design of the shot, but how you tell a story in the sequence. And, um, and those are just basics that you, know, you can learn from school too. Or, um, there's so many different books written about that as well, or ways to access that information or play around with a, a phone or, you know, there's so many different things you can do there. But having an understanding for all those basic techniques, like even green screen, I'd say like compositing, knowing some key words will help in that area. It'll help because I'd say the more experience you have, like hands-on experience you have with that, the quicker in the moment you'll be able to say, ah, I've had experience with green screen and this is either gonna help me toward my goal for this creative you know, request the director's made, or I know from experience it's gonna like take up a lot more time or not be the most efficient thing to do. So that's kind of where um, that helps as well. Um, the content and the directors drive what virtual production is on a project. And I don't keep repeating that, but it's really important. Um, you know, you don't want to, I'm thinking of this from a, a virtual production supervisor's perspective. That's why I keep saying it, just because you don't, you don't want to go in and tell somebody that they need something that they don't. It's not really about selling somebody a technique or a process. It's just about saying, um, here are a lot of different options. It sounds like these problems, like, you know, or these challenges you have getting from here to your final creative vision are at play. Maybe these are techniques that could work. Um, but it's really important to be clear what problems you're trying to solve as you go, because these techniques can be really expensive um, and can, I guess, the more complex that they get, cause a difficult user experience for the director, 
you know, if, you know, I'm trying to think of something on my mind would be like saying, oh yeah, sure. We can show you this in VR, you know? And like, there's a version of that where, yes, it's very easy to kind of show like grayscale geometry and um, like previous looking things like in a VR headset and some things are more plug and play than others. Um, but sometimes those workflows can be very extensive and we need to have a little bit more of a team to drive those um, workflows. And so really understanding all of those different things before you know you promise them on a project. You know, you wouldn't want to promise something that you kind of find out later, oh, there's so many more things to go with this. It's taking up like a big part of the budget just to do this little thing, that, this thing that we thought was small, that sort of thing. Um, and then third was casting the right artists is just as important as the choices for uh, which tools and technology and workflows will be applied on the project. And I just say, although the technology is awesome, it's the people who make it work. And so artists' soft skills are just as important as their technical resume, how they interact with others is just as important as how they approach artistic problem solving. And the same applies to vendors or like a company that might be offering you this service. Look for teams that have worked together on multiple projects and have a strong um, internal pipeline. So those are kind of my big takeaways. And um, I don't want to talk for too long because I want to just have more of a conversation and answer questions as I can. Um, so this might be a good time to just pass it on to questions. Thank you, Catherine. That was um, so informative. I feel like I've learned so much. Uh, so I, I had a few questions and then I, I, I see actually Mary Clark Miller here from Berkeley City and Ethan Wilde from Santa Rosa and uh, Mark Garrett, uh, who is, I know at Cal State East Bay tonight, but is also the department head at um, Mission College. <laughs> And uh, so I think one of the questions we have is uh, there's a lot of hesitation about the costs of shooting in LED volumes. Mm -hmm. We are um, exploring that with companies like Magic Box, having them maybe come to schools um, for like a couple of days a month. And so that could happen and we're really excited about it. Uh, but um, what are the small steps uh, students can take to learning VP without getting on a big volume, which could be problematic for some schools? Yeah, totally. Um, I would say with, with like the fun sort of small scale way that you can get into it is um, if at least if you have access to a computer that can run a game engine, can run Unreal or Unity, and you get familiar with that software, um, get to know in display in that plugin system. And you can set up an LED wall or like your own LED like monitor with a TV, essentially. You just need to have access to a panel. So if you just wanted to practice, um, or, you know, like for a short film even, like let's say you wanted to do a close-up of, in your living room, of somebody who's a passenger on an airplane or something. I like this example. You could probably, you could put like a TV screen with the background that you want, you know, like assuming you make that separately or get that plate, shoot a plate that makes sense to you. You can find a prop in your house that kind of creates what looks like a window that you can kind of throw out of focus. And you could just light a person in front of that like large LED TV. And as long as uh, you have a playback system, um, you know, that's, and that would be like Unreal Engine to in display hooking into that LED panel. You could have, you know, your own airplane scene or like a train scene or something. Um, I would say in a household, if you if you're going really small scale like that, you're getting close ups. So that's the trade off. I think with virtual like LED wall shoots, when you start scaling the amount of panels up to a full wall or a volume you're making the ecosystem a lot larger. Um, 
and that's there's just a cost to it. But if you're a student or an independent filmmaker, what's exciting is that there are at least in Los Angeles and a couple other cities studios that are popping up that have more not plug and play systems, but they have volumes that they've built and they have teams paired with those volumes. So you could build a relationship with that uh, stage and see if you could come in and explore or like let them know that you don't have a huge budget, but maybe on a day that they were planning to have their crew in any way to test things, could they, could you come in and see what your content looks like on the screen? Could you steal a shot? You know, would they give you a few hours here and there? I think that's a really good way for independent filmmakers to kind of pursue that right now is just building relationships with stages, um, you know, but the cost, there really is a cost there for that kind of workflow. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Alex Sutherland. He sent it directly to me, but um, Alex's question is, what sorts of game engines are being used currently in the industry? Um, there are more than I'm going to list off, but Unity and Unreal Engine are the most widely used, um, especially for virtual production. I'd say the differences between them mainly have been that up until this point, Unreal Engine has more built-in virtual production tools for like actual film production, um, whereas Unity, more engineers kind of have to create those tools from scratch. And I think that they're uh, catching up with Unreal in that capacity today, but um, they're also a little bit different under the hood, you know, when I'm working with our en my engineers, it takes them a little bit longer to solve uh, problems or like challenges in Unreal because it is so glossy. It's harder to get under the hood inside of the nodes to kind of really customize things or tweak what the engines say. But in Unity, it's kind of designed to be more engineer programmer accessible. Um, so you can access, you know, scripts and code in a much more direct way. But it's kind of six or half a dozen of the other, it depends what your engineering team you know, feels comfortable with. Thank you. Uh, we have another question. Um, everyone's sending their questions directly to me. Maybe post them to the whole, to everyone. Okay. So see them. But uh, if a student wants to develop, this is from, Soda, if a student wants to develop real camera tracking, would uh, VIVE Mars be effective? Uh, and could you easily explain how to output the UE5 virtual camera footage for LED wall or projector or even composition? I wouldn't be able to explain it easily on this panel. Um, <laughs> okay, I'm gonna maybe that's it. something that I can help with after the panel. Yeah, I'm just going to put it in, in the everyone so people can see the question, but yeah, okay. Yeah. We tried, Soda. It's a good one. Um, yeah. I had a question, uh, just really basic. What skills uh, should students start with? It's a great question. Um, I would say, that's why I kind of put the slide up to give like, to kind of help me head up. So in visualization, um, you know, definitely learning a game engine, like how to like move your way around game engine, whether it's Unreal or Unity is really important. So having technical skills in those game engines, um, if you're kind of on the visualization virtual art department side, um, you know, inside the game engine, you need to have skills in some like basic animation, uh, like sequencer, um, like kind of some artistic skills in design and shot design or storytelling. So that's kind of not so technical, but um, it's related to the technology. So being able to apply those skills inside the technology is important. Um, virtual art department, it's very 
heavy skill set in uh, Unreal Engine. And then I would say also like volumetric capture, like photogrammetry, um, knowing how to do some of those basic techniques. So if you needed to, you could capture assets of your own using a camera, uh, turning that into a model and then importing that into um, a game engine. That would be an important workflow. Um, the performance capture, maybe being well versed in a couple of different types of performance capture suits um, versus you know software. Um, the nice thing is that Unreal Engine also has a way to just import that data directly now as well. So you can do a lot more inside of that engine without having to leave and go into different software. Um, there's a really cool software suite called that Glassbox um, Studios came out with, which allows you to do virtual camera with iPad. And you can hook that into Unreal Unity as well and see the virtual scene that you created. So for a very low cost, um, that's a really cool system to get to know. And what is cool about that system also is that studios or companies like Halon or Third Floor use those products as well. So if you have exposure to them, then those are the same tools that those bigger companies are using to demonstrate or like virtual scout with directors already. So you could come in, having that on your resume would be great because they go, oh wow, you know, you don't have a ton of projects on your resume, but you have used these tools and that's what we use. So that's great. Um, so that could be a cool stepping stone. For stage operations um, and like crew on set, um, you have people on that team that are doing content playback. So if you wanted to be on set doing stage apps, knowing the game engine um, from you know a lighting perspective, from a virtual art department perspective, from a very creative perspective, like being able to do color correction volumes in an engine, that's an important skill set. Um, you always end up having a couple of people who are focused on camera tracking. So if you know a Skype camera tracking system, an optic, an optic track camera system, um, Moses is another system that I've seen used on some sets. Um, those are a few different types of camera tracking software that you can get to know fairly easy. And then there are other playback systems like Pixera. Pixera, I think, is relatively low cost, but might have a free version. And it's a playback software that was designed for live events, but uh, some bigger projects I've used it on uh, recently because it allows you to actually play higher resolution through Unreal Engine. <laughs> and so um, for us, it's been a way to bypass some higher costs that come with Disguise, which is a very high end live or like my playback system that is used widely. Um, and Disguise is another one to know, and they've been partnering with Row panels and have little, they have like a little test stage up in Chatsworth that uh, they're now offering like technical training on. You can get a certificate, you could go and just, I would recommend just going honestly, setting up an appointment with a salesperson and getting a free run through of the software. You know, I think because they're doing these, these paid trainings now, they kind of promote that. But the cool thing in it is in, the nice thing about having a background as a cinematographer is that um, to stay in the game in cinematography, you're kind of always going to rental houses and like looking at the newest lenses and like looking at filtration and you're proactive about kind of constantly educating yourself and putting together gear packages and things. So I, I'm kind of used to doing that. And that's something that I've applied in virtual production as well. You know, it's gonna be a little bit more spread out because there isn't just like, like a rental house that is kind of pulling all this stuff together. Although there are more now, like Able Cine might be a good place, you know, to have contacts around virtual production, but PRG might be another one in Glendale. Um, 
I know these are LA based names that I'm giving you, but if you have a chance to come down, um, these would be free places or, or places that would give you free information and a tour of these facilities without um, expecting you to write something first. Um, so, yeah. That's it. Oh. Uh, I had one more question for you, and it's a little broad, but um, I know that diversifying the industry is important to you. I'd love to hear like why you think it's important. Our students come from such a diverse range of backgrounds, and I think it, you know, it's it's really important for us to um, make it known to our students why their perspectives um, can really add to the world and to these industries. Yeah, well, I mean, it's so important because, um, oh, man, it just, it's so incredibly important because um, there just, even in my lifetime, I thought that I was walking into an industry where I could have more of a straight line toward a career path that I wanted. Um, and there are just so many unnecessarily, unnecessarily like roadblocks, you know, that are in this industry. Um, I would say that um, things have gotten better recently after the Me Too movement and after, you know, like 2018, 2019, like the more topics of conversation that are coming up where people are like, more open to these conversations, but um, we we really need people in hiring positions to be looking at people's resumes differently. You know, right now we, in, in the industry, people will look at your resume and like size you up based on what you've done, and it's such a catch twenty two. Um, the way that the industry is sort of set up is uh, a meritocracy, which kind of means that there is this popularity aspect to it. It's like, you know, like the fun side of the meritocracy is that people are mentoring others up into these artistic roles. And that's like the fun idealistic part of it. But the way that that doesn't work is that it means that, you know, like just statistically, like white men who have kind of always been able to have these positions or like kind of are the majority in these industries who they know who they socialize with you know that's and that's usually people that look like them or talk like them or that they can relate to they end up having like a, more opportunities I think and so in personally in my career once I realized that focusing on relationships with other women um, was how my energy should be spent and kind of like really putting more of my energy just in supporting other women who I was working with, women and minorities and um, kind of creating like strong systems where we were connected and like helping each other succeed and seeing that that was working, creating databases so that we could find each other. I also kind of came into the industry at a time when um, there weren't like groups or like databases for, I would say women specifically, because that was my experience. And so something that a bunch of us put together were like, you know, female cinematographers groups, female directors groups, uh, women in media supporting all people below the line, just so that we could find each other and work together. Um, and so I think something that, something that virtual production does is that with the game engine component is that it cracks the industry open in a different way. It's going to challenge unions that are historically racist, you know, and like keep people out um, because some of these jobs that are being created in virtual production cross over into visual effects and camera or visual effects and you know production design and it's going to challenge the essence of like the union 
how they're structured, it's going to challenge how visual effects businesses are structured. It's going to challenge how these new roles kind of fit into that. And some of the conversations that I've had on a higher level with people, even you know, at Epic Games and other companies that are investing in these workflows, are how can we how can we invest in creating real pathways for people to succeed? Because I don't think that that's really been addressed um, with how the unions have been set up historically or some of these other workflows that are like inside of you know, businesses. Um, I think um, it's really important. It's just an important point in time to be investing in people differently, looking at their um, potential, not just what they're coming in with on their resume. And I think that's that's the ideal, like that's the what I see as a possibility with virtual production. And I think that I just want to be that candid and talk about it that way because I think that as students or people who are mid-career, I'm not really sure about everyone's experience on this call, but I think that you should um, stand up for that and kind of demand that and not take any less than that um, and make sure that people are looking at your potential because, um, you know, that's, I think there's this ideal, but then there's like the reality. But when you're faced with that reality, just demand what you're worth, basically. And part of that, so like the constructive way to look for that is like, make sure that you have find mentors, find somebody who's who's excited about you, has a similar passion as you, who want, who, you know, you can just talk with about what, what's the next step. Um, make sure that the companies that you are looking to work with, if whether it's a company or like just an independent supervisor like myself, anybody, make sure that you're interviewing them back and that they're running a team in a healthy way. Um, you know, that you feel respected and that you feel visible. That's really important. Um, and I would also say, um, make sure that they have, they're like, they are excited about cultivating you and your skill set. So they're like, that, so in those interview conversations that they're excited about your potential and you're, you feel free to say like, I really, I think I'm going to start here, but I, I'd like to do this and this. And, you know, you're finding people who are like, cool, that sounds great. Let's find a path for you to do that. That's kind of what you want to hear somebody say. If you're not hearing somebody say that, maybe it's good to think about that position twice, you know. So I hope that helps answer that question. Yeah, thank you. That's such a great, that's great advice for students and in, even for me and so inspiring. Um, we're coming to the end of our hour and uh, I just wanted to take a minute to say thank you so much, Catherine, for coming and doing this presentation for us. Um, I know we recorded it, so for people who didn't come, we can uh, pass that on. Uh, and yeah, Olivia, do you want to have anything you want to say? I, I just want to say again the same thing. Thank you so much, Catherine, for sharing. Um, and I think I, I picked up a lot of notes here that I think I'm going to take back to our team about, you know, I, I picked up some ideas as to where are the entry level um, opportunities in, in looking at, at this image that you have here. And it, you know, what I'm taking away is it, that it might be in the areas of, um, you know, um, bad, uh, mm -hmm. because that's where a lot of our our, our programs are focusing on uh, the performance capture. We've got a mm -hmm. lot of strength in those areas. And so this has been very informative. I'm making notes here about how we follow up on it. I wanna thank you so much again for uh, joining us. Um, and then um, Sarah, do we wanna, do you have something uh, to uh, just, we always close with what's next. Um, so um, Sarah, do, do we have a screen there for that? I don't know. Yeah, um, do you mind unsharing your screen, Catherine, please? Thank you. And then um, here we go. Our next tech talk will be on March 9th. 
and it will focus on careers in internet infrastructure. So a very different, very different topic than virtual production. Um, but we look forward to seeing everyone um, at the next Tech Talk. And Catherine, I loved that last piece so much. It was incredible. I'm, I'm inspired. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Again, thank you everyone for coming. And uh, this, this, this will be, the recording will be placed on the Bay ICT uh, website and uh, we'll let everybody know when that's ready. Thank you.